This is going to be verse by verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 1. It says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So Paul still has some visions and revelations he will get from the Lord before he goes to be with the Lord. Me and you get visions and revelations from the Lord when we read his word. And this is unlike Paul who saw the Lord and heard the Lord. He even saw the third heaven and came back. Today, men claim to see the third heaven and write books. They make movies. They have special meetings telling their stories. And this is all for money. But they didn't really go to heaven. The heaven is for real movie was a joke. The angels supposedly laughed at the boys singing the song, We Will Rock You. You know, I don't think a holy angel is going to laugh at a song made by the open sodomite of, of the band Queen. But notice what Paul said, though, in verse 1. He said, It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. There was no need in Paul going around talking about all the visions and revelations he had all the time. Some people go around the country talking about dreams, visions, and junk that they made up. Paul teaches us the Word of God is more important and reliable. In 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So it is the Word of God and not dreams and visions that are profitable today. Peter himself, who saw so many miracles and supernatural things, explains that the Word of God itself is more sure than what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. In 2 Peter 1.19, he said, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. So the word is more reliable than dreams and visions. Now, 2 Corinthians 12.2, I, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in a body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth such an one caught up to the third heaven. Paul knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Paul seems to be speaking of himself. So he's called up to the third heaven. He saw what John saw in Revelation 4. And if you knew what Paul knew, you would be dangerous for the Lord. The devil and devils would hate you. They already do. But that is why devils say they knew Paul in Acts 19.15. They know him very well and they hate him. Paul says in verse 3, I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which is not lawful for a man to utter. So paradise is the third heaven. Before the cross, it was in the heart of the earth. In Luke 23, 43, Jesus told the dying thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And where was Jesus going that day? The heart of the earth. It says in Ephesians 4, 9, that Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he said in Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he told the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Where was he going that day? The heart of the earth. So paradise was in the heart of the earth. That is where the Old Testament saints went at death. Then Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, and resurrected. And at this time, the Old Testament saints went to paradise in the third heaven. So it seems paradise moved from the heart of the earth to the third heaven, but there could also be more than one paradise. Now, 2 Corinthians 12, 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So Paul saw and heard some things that he can't speak of. He saw some things that the Lord wouldn't let him write about in his epistles. He heard unspeakable words, yet men today claim to see heaven and write novels about it. But it seems like Paul died and came back. It seems like he experienced a resurrection. And we don't know that for sure, but Paul was stoned and the people thought they killed him. This may have been what when he went to the third heaven. After he was stoned, in Acts 14, 19, and 20, it says, And there came to their certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So they thought he, they killed him. 
Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. I wouldn't want to get in, fight, in a fight with Paul. I mean, he, he got stoned to death and still got back up. But you can't keep a good man down. You see this on all the movies. You know, they think the hero is dead, and then he just gets back up. But you have guys today claiming to be preaching in one place, and at the same time preaching in another place. And they call it by location. And these people are some of the biggest fakes and liars. The same guy talks about injecting the Holy Spirit in his veins like he would drugs. And he, he's always talking about heavy, drunken glory. Everyone in his congregation is high, literally. He's claiming to be in two places at once. But they claim to be leaving the body and going to preach somewhere else at the same time that they are preaching at another place. But these are false apostles. They're trying to be like the Apostle Paul who was caught up to the third heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, 5, it says, If such an one will I glory, yet of myself will I not glory, but in mine infirmities. So Paul glories in his infirmities, because in them he learns to lean more on God. And when you're in pain or discomfort, you tend to call on the Lord more. You're always stronger in fellowship with the Lord. So it is a paradox. When you're weak, you're actually strong. It seems one way, but it's really the other way. 2 Corinthians 12, 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Don't think too highly of Paul. He called himself the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1.15. He called himself a wretched man in Romans 7.24. He said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing in Romans 7.18. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So Paul was getting abundance of revelations. Imagine if today you were discovering things in the Bible, uh, it, and that Bible discovered for the last 2,000 years, the people hadn't discovered for the last 2,000 years, and people wanted to hear you speak and they wanted you to sign their Bible. They, they looked to you as the greatest Bible authority on the planet. And that could make you get the big head if you don't watch it. Paul had a similar thing going on. He was not only getting revelations from the Bible that nobody ever did. He was also writing the revelations God gave to him directly that would help him complete the whole Bible. You could get the big head after that, after a, a while of that. So that's why God gives him a thorn in the flesh. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So to keep Paul from getting the big head, the Lord lets him have this thorn in the flesh, and he asked God to get rid of it, but the Lord made him bear it. 2 Corinthians 12, 8, and 9, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So he let Paul bear it, because the thorn kept him closer to God. The more the thorn bothered Paul, the more he leaned on the Lord. Now verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in my infirm infir infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. So infirmity is an unhealthy state of the body, weakness of mind or the body. This can cause you to get closer to God. When you're hurting so much, Tylenol don't help anymore. The only thing that can help you is God. Paul was facing reproaches. People were running their mouth about him constantly, especially to the Corinthians. Paul had necessities. When you travel everywhere and you're not settling down somewhere with a full-time job, you will have a lot of necessities. Paul says in persecutions, and he said in 2 Timothy 3.12, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Corinthians 12.11 says, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So Paul once again calls himself a fool for glorying in himself. And he's the only person that looks humble while bragging. 
Uh, the average man constantly brags on himself, but he doesn't say, uh, you know, I'm a fool for saying this. You know, anytime I see someone uh, bragging, I think, well, this guy looks silly, but, you know, he doesn't say that he looks silly. He thinks he looks good. And anytime I see somebody bragging, I think about how foolish they look. But the Corinthians compelled him to brag because of their lack of confidence in him. He says they should have commended him, and they should have. In Proverbs 27, 2, it says, Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. See, the Corinthians, they weren't commending Paul. They were commending all these false apostles, and Paul felt it necessary to say some good things about himself to try to win them back from these false apostles. You know, he's jealous over them with godly jealousy. And he says, I am become a fool in glorying. You have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For, am, for in nothing am I behind the very cheapest apostles, though I be nothing. So even though Paul is nothing, the other apostles, and especially the false apostles, are no more of nothing than he is. They're no more than he is. Paul has proved a thousand times over of his apostleship. And he says in verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The signs were for apostles to use. So another reason you don't see the signs of an apostle today is because all the apostles are dead. The reason you see them in Paul's writings is because he had the signs of an apostle and was still alive. Paul had the signs of, a, of an apostle. He had signs and wonders of an apostle. For example, in Mark 16, 17, and 18, it, it tells you these signs. And it says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now, Paul is mentioned of doing all these except for the drinking any deadly thing. In terms of casting out devils, he's done that. Speaking with new tongues, he said, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Taking up serpents, you know, in the book of Acts, he got bit by the viper and he just shook it off into the fire. He lay hands on the sick in so much that, you know, he could just give somebody a handkerchief and it would heal them. So Paul had these signs of an apostle. And in thir verse 13, he says, For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. So Paul is being sarcastic and saying, Forgive me for not taking your money like that TBN crowd. You know, he said, Except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you, forgive me this wrong. For what is it wherein you were inferior to other churches? You know, he's, he's being sarcastic a lot of times. He says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought, to, ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So this is going to be the third time that Paul comes to them. And once again, he isn't going to be burdensome to them. He's going to pay his own way. That's why he says, And I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours but you. He doesn't seek their money. He, he wants them. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. He is their spiritual father. You know, the Bible says, Call no man on earth your father, but in a sense, you know, he's their, you, you, he begotten them through the gospel. Paul is their spiritual father in the Lord. They were the children. They were his children. This is because he led them to the Lord himself. In 1 Corinthians 4.15, it says, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, Yet have ye not many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. The same way a parent lays up for the children and not the children for the parents is the same way Paul had no problem ministering to the, them spiritual things without getting physical things in return. A good preacher just doesn't care about the money. Paul said in verse 14, I seek not yours, but you. He didn't need their money. He needed them to have an earnest desire for the things of God. Now, verse 15, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. 
Paul would rather say I'm spent when he got done ministering to the Corinthians than to say my belly is full, my pocket is full, my backpack is full, and I love this new camel that you just bought me. You know, he would rather say I'm spent. He would rather give all he has instead of taking all that they've got. Now, you have all these crooked preachers telling everyone to give until it hurts. A lady once ran out of money to give, so she started bringing the bracelets her husband had bought her to the pastor, and then her husband, her lost husband, of course is upset, goes down to get the bracelets back, and the pastor won't give it back, and you can guess what happens next. 2 Corinthians twelve sixteen. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. The fact that Paul didn't take money from the Corinthians helped him win them to the Lord. This is because the lost world sees Christians as crooks. I mean, all they talk about is money, 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 money. It makes it gives people the idea that God can't do anything without your money. But from what I've seen, it is the Christians who are tricked by the TBN crooks and not the lost people. So, Paul sarcastically says, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Referring to the fact he purposefully didn't take money so that he could win them to the Lord easier. And he says in verse 17, Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? You see, Paul nor any of his fellow helpers made money off the Corinthians. He said in verse 18, I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Did, you know, did Titus make money off of him? And, he, and Paul says, Walk we not in the same spirit? Walk we not in the same steps? Titus walked in the same spirit as Paul, and in the same steps as Paul, they had the same mind toward the Corinthians. Their desire was to see the Corinthians walk with the Lord, not to take their money. Verse 19, again, thank ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. Paul's burden was to edify the saints. He was not in it to make a living. He was, he was sent by the Lord for the edifying of the body of Christ. Verse 20, For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. Paul was afraid he would come to them and they would be living wickedly, and that he would not find them as he would. He was afraid he would find them fighting amongst themselves, which is what you see today. Christians going back and forth, debating each other harshly on doctrine, envying each other's ministry, because one has more followers than the other. They're full of wrath for each other. And you can see it in their eyes when they talk about that brother in Christ. They are preaching Christ of envy and strife. As Paul says in Philippians 1, 15, 16, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds. So backbiting and whispering against one another. Paul says in Galatians 5.15, But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Now verse 21 Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. See, the Corinthians had a problem with fornication as a whole, and not just the man in 1 Corinthians 5. In 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. It was reported commonly. It was a common thing with the Corinthians. So he says, unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and then I shall be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness, and fornication, and lasciviousness which they have committed. So when Paul comes the third time, he's wanting them to have things straightened up so that he can just come and they can fellowship, talk about the book, he can teach them things, and not have to spend a bunch of time rebuking them. And telling them that they need to get right. They, sh they need to already be right when he comes. But this has been a great chapter. Showed us a lot of great things about the Apostle Paul. And I hope you got something out of it.